let's get started with a professorial story. One day there was a prof and he wanted to make a point to the students. So he walks over to the side of the lecture room and he picks up a bottle with a wriggling live worm in it. And he pours in a little bit of tobacco juice. The worm dies. Walks over, picks up another bottle, another live worm in it. Pours in a little bit of chocolate syrup and the worm dies. Does it a third time with yet another wriggling live worm. Pours in a little bit of alcohol and the worm dies. Looks out at the students, says, what do you make of that? And one inventive kid in the back says, sir, I know, if you drink smoky chocolate, you don't have to worry about the worms. <laughs> <coughs> he made the right observation, but came to the wrong conclusion. And basically, this is what we deal with uh, through my office at McGill. Uh, trying to make sure that, that people look at the evidence, they make proper observations, and come to the right conclusions. We try to shine the spotlight into the dark crevices of the dark world of pseudoscience. And we do this without any conflict of interest. Uh, we accept no uh, funding from any vested source. It makes no difference to me or to my colleagues whether or not any chemical, be it a pesticide, a cosmetic, or a drug, is regulated or banned. The only thing that makes a difference is that whatever decision is arrived at, is arrived at based on proper scientific methodology, not on emotion, not on hearsay, and not on the all-knowing they say. So about 18 years ago, uh, McGill said that our job is not over the moment that our students graduate and pass out through our gates. Because today there's such hunger out there for scientific information that if it isn't fulfilled in a proper, unbiased way, then people end up listening to whoever is standing on top of the tallest soapbox, screaming the loudest. And uh, those tend to be the quacks. <laughs> but you know what? They're not so easily recognized because they have managed to cloak themselves in the garb of science and they have learned to spout very seductive pseudoscientific lingo. And they're getting bigger and bigger and better and better at what they do. And it's getting harder and harder to deal with them. Uh, we try to overturn their cockamamie ideas, but they just multiply like rabbits. They're absolutely everywhere. And uh, it is our task, really, to try to counter it by demystifying the science, by pe keeping people up to date on what happens in the world of science. And we hope to foster critical thinking, separate sense from nonsense. All of that works keep people out of the clutches of charlatans. <coughs> and when we started this enterprise, I thought we needed a logo. And I suggested this one to the university. <laughs> now don't get all upset, we're not against raising animals or even eating them. Uh, what we're against is this commodity, which is <laughs> being piled higher and deeper, and it's getting to be harder and harder to dig out from underneath it. It's everywhere. You can go to your local health food store and buy some aerobic oxygen. <coughs> I'm not sure where you would go to buy anaerobic oxygen, but you get the aerobic variety here. And they will tell you that we need to put a couple of drops of this into a glass of water and consume it every day because the atmosphere is running short of oxygen and therefore so are we. This is of course absolute gobbledygook, there's no truth to that. Uh, what do they have in here? A smidgen of potassium chlorate, which in theory can release a trace amount of oxygen, far less than you would have in a breath. It's irrelevant. Plus, of course, you can add to that that we don't breathe through our guts, so there was no point in putting oxygen into our stomach anyway. It's absolute nonsense. But they will tell you that we need to, to supply ourselves with this oxygen because the atmosphere is losing it. And then in a bizarre juxtaposition, on the next shelf, they can have antioxidants. So on one shelf, they're telling us that we're running out of oxygen, therefore we better start consuming it. And then on the other shelf, they're telling us that, boy, that oxygen can devastate you by producing free radicals. You better start getting those antioxidants. But of course, you will have people who will tell you that when they follow this regimen, they feel so much better. This, of course, is the classic placebo effect. It doesn't matter what you give people. It doesn't matter if it's aerobic oxygen or the triply distilled chromatograph sweat of virgin three-legged Himalaya mules. If they believe that 
it is going to be good for them, it will be. You can unfortunately sell just about anything to a scientifically ill-informed public, <coughs> including dehydrated water. Uh, yeah, there's a business uh, uh, selling that. And you know what people really clamor for, though? Something that strikes fear to the heart of any chemist. They want chemical-free products. Now, of course, this is the height of absurdity because everything in the world, as you well know, is made of chemicals. Uh, even this jar, which purports to be chemical-free, of course, isn't because it contains air. And air is, of course, a mixture of, uh, of chemicals. The fact is that if you are buying something that is chemical-free, you're not getting a good deal because you're getting absolutely nothing. But the word chemical raises fears in people's eyes. It is associated with poison, with toxicity. It's synonymous with toxins. And chemists are evil people who are in their laboratories just thinking about what new cancer-causing additive to put into our food supply. Why? What's their intent? Obviously, to kill off customers. <laughs> so there is anxiety, there is fear out there. There is a great deal of confusion and disorientation and bewilderment. People are intellectually lost. The fact is that chemistry is really the thread that ties all of the other sciences together. If you have a feel for what molecules are, you get kind of an idea of what can and cannot happen in the world. If you have a basic concept of chemical reactions, you know what is reasonable and what is not. And the fact is that we make decisions based upon chemistry every single day. Numerous times during the day, we come to the proverbial fork in the road, where we have to make a decision. Uh, you decide for lunch what you're going to have. Is it going to be pizza or hamburger? What are you going to have with it? A soft drink or water? And if it's a soft drink, which kind? Diet drink or sugar-laden drink? And if it's water, tap water or bottled water? So these are all decisions. At night, you decide what you're going to cook and what you're going to cook it in. Is it going to be stainless steel or Teflon or, <coughs> or copper or aluminum? People have concerns because they've heard that aluminum is linked with Alzheimer's disease. I've been cooking in aluminum all my life and I can't remember any problems. <laughs> so <laughs> these are all decisions that are based on chemistry. And the fact is that chemicals are not to be feared, neither are they to be worshipped. They are to be understood. And with understanding, much of the fear is lost. We have to get across to the general public that the world is made of chemicals, a fantastic variety of them. Chemical Abstracts now lists over 60 million known chemicals. That's a staggering number. Of these, more than 99% occur in nature. But those are not the ones that get the attention from the media. It is that 0.1% of synthetic chemicals that are blamed for unraveling the fabric of society. If you have a look at your lunch or supper, you realize there are hundreds of compounds. When you sniff a cup of coffee, you're sniffing, believe it or not, over a thousand different compounds, most of which have actually been isolated and categorized, which is, you know, a testimonial to the talents of the analytical chemist that that can be done. We are therefore filled with chemicals because we obviously are composed of the food that we eat. It is the only raw material that ever goes into our body. So <coughs> every chemical in our body can be traced back to some component in food. And of course, every chemical that comes out of our body, and there are plenty of those as well, also traces back to that. The body is basically just a chemical reactor where we take in raw substances, use them, and excrete whatever is not needed. And we excrete it not only the urine, our breath, our saliva, uh, of course, contains numerous compounds. And we do analysis of blood and milk and fecal matter, there are hundreds and hundreds of different compounds. So basically, we are a large bag of chemicals. 
That's what we are. And a lot of people are disturbed to hear that because they think chemicals, you know, should be locked away in a flask somewhere in, in the laboratory. But chemical is not a dirty word. It's just a descriptor of the basic substances of which everything is composed. <coughs> but I tell you, it is very easy to demonize them if you so want to do. Let me give you an example. Let's look at an apple, or better yet, Take a bite out of that apple. What are we tasting? <coughs> this is what we're tasting. These are not additives. These are not pesticide residues. These are the basic building blocks of that apple. That's what it is made of, including acetone. Now, the last time you encountered acetone was probably on the label of your nail polish remover, right above where it says, do not drink. For good reason. Acetone is a highly toxic substance. You do not want to drink it. Also in that apple, you have formaldehyde. You've heard of formaldehyde. That's basically embalming fluid. That's what morticians use to preserve bodies. It is a highly toxic substance. In fact, formaldehyde is a carcinogen. And there it is in the apple. So I could tell you, you know that Every time you bite into an apple, you're getting acetone. That's toxic. That can kill you. But it's an economical way to go because you will be pre-embalmed. <laughs> well, that may rub you the wrong way. But there's some rubbing alcohol in there as well <laughs> because there's isopropyl alcohol in that apple. But of course, as we well know, that apple isn't sitting around waiting to take a bite out of us. Apples are, in fact, very healthy fruits to eat, despite the fact that they contain a known carcinogen, formaldehyde, and a known poison, acetone. What's going on here? Well, several things. One, let's hearken back to the cornerstone of toxicology, as first laid by that great sage, physician, alchemist, Paracelsus. Over 500 years ago, when he said that only the dose makes the poison. Dosage is critical. Obviously, the amount of acetone, the amount of formaldehyde in that apple is trivial. It doesn't do us any harm. But interestingly enough, you find them in higher concentrations than the pesticide residues on that apple. And yet, it is the trivial amount of pesticide residues that scare the pants off of people. But you can see how by selective information, you can, in fact, scare somebody uh, about chemicals in their food supply, uh, where the scare is absolutely relevant once you establish the idea that only the dose makes the poison. Now, that, though, um, has to be put into perspective as well, because it is true that with some substances, that dose can be very, very small. So if you think of something like ricin in the castor bean, uh, that is so toxic that a couple of micrograms could do away with everyone in this room. Botulin falls into the same category. <coughs> but still, the dose does make the poison, but sometimes that dose indeed can be very, very small. People sometimes ask the question, you know, is aspirin toxic? Well, it makes no sense to ask that question. You know that if you have a headache, and you take an aspirin tablet and you lick it, your headache will not go away. If you take two tablets and swallow them, your headache will go away. If you take the whole bottle of tablets and swallow them, you will go away. <laughs> so does it make sense to ask, is aspirin toxic? No. You have to put it into context. The same way when it, we talk about pesticide residues or, or, or herbicide residues or natural toxins in the food, you have to put it into context. Ask how much is in there and how does that compare to what we know causes a problem? Why do we have to do these things? Because we go through life evaluating risk. That's what we do. Now, of course, not necessarily in a conscious way, but every time when you, you, know, you open that fridge and you see that something has been sitting there for a couple of weeks and you ask yourself the question, should I eat it or not? That's really a question of risk evaluation. <laughs> That's what you're doing. 
Of course, sometimes it can be a lot more complicated than that. But in the scientific realm, we go about risk evaluation by making judicious use of the peer-reviewed literature. This is the altar at which we worship, perhaps sometimes too much, relying on it too much. But peer-reviewed literature is still the best way to gather information. Is it foolproof? Of course not. That dreadful fraudulent paper by Andrew Wakefield making a link between vaccination and autism appeared in The Lancet, one of the world's leading medical journals. How did that happen? Because, of course, when you're a referee and you're asked to review a paper, you cannot redo the experiment. That work may have been the work of several people over many years. So you have to assume that what is submitted in that document was done the way that it is described and the data were accumulated the way that they say. If someone is going to submit fraudulent data, that is not going to be caught until someone tries to replicate the work. And that's when you find a problem. That's why one of the hallmarks of science is that we don't pay attention to anything until it's been duplicated. A single study doesn't mean anything other than that it should be the springboard to do another study to see whether or not the data uh, can be uh, justified. So uh, no peer-reviewed literature is not perfect. Uh, we know that there are a lot of papers that, that present information, present data that has not been duplicated. In fact, uh, if you are aware of the current trend in scientific literature today, there are many, many articles about that. Uh, John Ioannidis uh, is a, a physician who champions this, this, uh, this issue of, of uh, somehow trying to improve peer review uh, because he claims with a good deal of evidence that about half of all scientific papers that are published have, have uh, fatal flaws and uh, cannot be uh, reproduced. But anyway, at least we try because we try to make decisions based upon the evidence. Whether or not that evidence is properly presented is correct or not, that's a different question. But at least we try to base it on evidence. On the other hand, the general public mostly works on the basis of emotion. An emotion will outweigh logic. Let me give you an example. True story. One day, a foursome of ladies was playing golf on a course just outside of, of Montreal, early in the morning, and a truck comes by, spray truck, and they feel the spray. They rush back into the clubhouse and accost the greenskeeper. One of them says, gee, got a headache. The other one got a rash. The third one had the biggest problem of all. <laughs> and I'm sure you've already guessed the bottom line to the story. Of course, there was a truck out there spraying early in the morning. It was spraying water. But of course, these ladies were so tuned in to the problem of pesticides, they had been reading uh, about it, that they were sure that they had been sprayed by some sort of toxic substance and therefore got the symptoms. Now, it's also important to appreciate the fact that those symptoms were real. They really felt that, that headache. Right? This is what we call the nocebo effect which is sort of the, the bad cousin of the placebo effect. The placebo effect is um, one of the most important effects in medicine, as well as in what we refer to as alternative medicine. Uh, whenever there's belief that something will do you good, 30 to 40% of the time, it will. Of course, it will not cure the underlying condition, but it will change your perception of the condition. So the placebo effect is indeed very important. And uh, this uh, also comes into play, as we just saw, with the issue of pesticides. When people are so worried about these, because they've heard about you know, potential toxicity and all of the risks, they can actually feel sick when they just believe that they've been exposed to, to pesticides. Now, of course, that in no way means that you cannot have legitimate reactions to pesticides. Of course you can. I mean, let's face it. Pesticides are dangerous substances. They're toxic substances. That's what they are designed to be. 
they are designed to kill. Pesticides are designed to kill insects, they're designed to kill fungi, and they are designed to kill weeds. So of course, by definition, they are toxic. However, we use them because we cannot produce the food supply that we need at the cost that we need without the judicious use of agrochemicals. And the reason, of course, for that is that there are many species out there, insects of all kinds, that would like to eat the same things that we eat. So there's a competition. Who gets there first? And very often, they get there first. Estimates are that 40 to 50 percent of all the food that is grown never gets eaten. Now, that's a, that's a frightening kind of a, a statistic, especially when you calculate the input in terms of, of pesticides, fertilizer, and all the trucks delivering these things, the, green, the uh, gas emissions, etc. Wasting half of the food that we grow is, 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 is tragic. Now, of course, pesticides are toxic not only to insects and weeds, they are potentially poisonous for humans as well if they are not properly used. And unfortunately, there are areas of the world where they are not properly used, where the training is insufficient, where they don't even read so that they make mistakes. They don't know that a, a certain chemical has to be dil diluted before used. Uh, they don't recognize the fact that you need to have protective equipment. So yes, in the developing world, there is a great deal of, of pesticide poisoning, without a doubt. In North America, of course, we see much less of that because here there's training. Farmers, as you well know, have to know how to use pesticides and how to protect themselves. <laughs> you know, when show a picture like that, when you see a farmer out there spraying in a hazmat suit, then people think, oh my goodness, you know, look what he has to do to protect himself. And we're eating all of these foods which have the same chemicals on them. Well, of course, they don't have the same chemicals on them in the same concentration. That's the key. But also, it's interesting to note that what you're looking at here is an organic farmer who has a field of cauliflower and is spraying with a, a natural insecticide, which is a soap spray, which is less toxic than many of the synthetic pesticides. But you certainly don't want to inhale this because it will dissolve the mucus lining of the lungs. So you have to take proper, proper care. But no matter what, these are risky substances because they are designed to be risky substances. That's the, the reason that, that, that we use them. If pesticides were, were not a problem in terms of toxicity, they would also be useless. But there certainly are some frightening statistics. There are about 3 million pesticide poisonings worldwide every year. That is a lot. And uh, a very large percentage of this uh, is intentional suicides. And that's because some of these substances, particularly the organophosphates, uh, are very, very readily available in the third world. And uh, it's a very easy way to commit uh, uh, suicide. Uh, GMOs certainly have cut down on the use of organophosphates. And uh, in areas where uh, genetic modified crops are grown, uh, there have been fewer uh, problems with organophosphates sig significantly. But the real risks of pesticides are through illegitimate use or uh, in the workplace, if proper precautions are not taken, because there you can be exposed to significant uh, doses. And uh, unfortunately, if you go back to the 50s and 60s, uh, there were m many cases when workers were not properly protected and there were issues. Today, it really is quite a different world. Uh, today, the pesticide industry has, has really cleaned up its act and it's very rare to have um, some sort of you know, industrial accident in a uh, pesticide manufacturing uh, plant. But farmers, of course, are exposed to pesticides. I mean, this is, you know, this is uh, without a doubt, because they're the ones who are out there spraying. And this can give rise to, pr to problems. We know, for example, that there is a greater incidence of Parkinson's disease in farming communities. Now, exactly why that is, is, is not so easy to determine. There is pretty solid evidence that it can be linked to certain pesticides. 
But because farmers have such a distinctly different lifestyle from the general population, it is very difficult to, conf to correct for all confounding variables. Uh, how, you know, how can you correct for uh, working X number of hours a day you know, uh, outdoors? Uh, very often breathing uh, vapors, gasoline vapors from the tractors and, and, and the trucks. I mean, all of these things have to be uh, taken into account. But I think it's also interesting to note that it's not only synthetic pesticides uh, that are, are the problem here. Uh, rotenone, which is a pesticide that was used in organic agriculture quite extensively, much less so now. Uh, this is a natural pesticide extracted from the roots of the deris plant, and that also has been linked to Parkinson's disease. So it has nothing to do with whether that chemical is synthetic or, or, or natural. Uh, in fact, this uh, is one of the biggest myths that we in the scientific community fight. And I would say that you know, in my close to 40 years of being in this business, that is the single biggest myth. The belief that if something is natural, it's benign and good, if it's synthetic, then it's, it's questionable and probably bad for us. There's no such equation. Uh, nature is not benign. Nature is very dangerous. Bacteria and viruses and fungi are natural. As I said, botulin and ricin are the most toxic substances we know, and they're, uh, they're natural. Tornadoes are natural. Tidal waves are, are, are natural. We spend much of our life trying to overcome the ravages of nature. So it has absolutely nothing to do with whether a substance is natural or synthetic. What determines the potential risks and benefits of any chemical is its molecular structure and what it does in the body, what it interacts with. And that isn't always easy to determine, but it's not whether it's natural or not. Now there are, of course, very stringent regulations about what pesticides can be used and how. Uh, in, in the US, it basically is up to the EPA and FDA to decide. FDA looks at residues on, on foods. EPA looks at what can be used on, uh, on the farm. In uh, Canada, it's the Pesticide Management Regulatory Agency, which is a branch of Health Canada that uh, looks into this. They're the ones who, like the EPA, will take submissions from companies that want to market a pesticide and decide whether or not that pesticide should be, the term used is registered. That is, can it be used and how? in what doses, on what kind of crops, etc. Today, all these submissions are electronic, but it used to be on paper. Let me show you the submission on paper for one pesticide. Here it is. Hundreds of thousands of pages, because the requirements are to show evidence of safety, in test animals, they look at the epidemiological evidence, they, they ask you to examine just how it is going to be used, is it going to be used as a liquid, the aerosol, or, or whatever. I mean, there are tremendous demands. And then, of course, they will decide whether or not it can be used. And if the decision is that it can be used, there will be very strict regulations about how much, how it's to be used, and where and what crops it can be used. Well, this, this idea of you know, selling kind of safe food, uh, I guess is best exemplified by the organic uh, industry, which is a very interesting uh, industry. These days, of course, everybody is looking to, to buy organic, uh, even though they're not absolutely sure of what that, that means. I mean, what is organic? I mean, the only thing that really is quite obvious is that it costs more. Although not always, but, but uh, it usually uh, does. There are uh, essentially uh, three reasons why people buy organic. One, for what they think is not in there, which is pesticide residues. Two, for what they think is in there, which is more nutrition. And third, for environmental safety. Well, the pesticide residue business uh, can be countered because there are dozens of pesticides that can be used in organic agriculture. For example, copper sulfate can be widely used in organic agriculture because the criterion is that it has to come from a natural source. Well, that, as I told you before, has nothing to do with safety. It's a 
it's an arbitrary decision. You know, that if you want organic, well, then you have to use an organic uh, pesticide. Now, that's not to say that these are not regulated. They are regulated exactly the same way as any other pesticide. The regulatory agencies don't ask, is it natural or synthetic? They don't care. They look at what the chemical is and what the evidence is. But copper sulfate is no safer or less safe than any other pesticide, but it can be used in organic agriculture. The most interesting one is the Bacillus thuringiensis bacterium, which can be sprayed on organic crops because this bacterium produces a protein that kills insects. It's natural, bacteria are natural, so there's no problem here. But here's the interesting feature. That bacterium contains thousands and thousands, probably about 30,000 genes. Only one of those genes is responsible for producing that, that protein that you want. If you isolate that gene and put it directly into a, into a crop, then organic farmers can't use that because then it's a genetically engineered crop. So it's quite okay to spray the whole genome of the bacterium on the crop for the one gene, but you can't take that one gene and put it into the crop because then it becomes genetically uh, modified. This is really bizarre. If anyone should be supporting that, it shouldn't be the organic farmers. Because why would you want to put 29,999 useless genes on your crop when you only want uh, the protein that's selected for by that, that single gene? Now that being said though, I think it is true that conventional agriculture does use more pesticides. There, I mean, this can be statistically shown. Uh, there are far more synthetic uh, pesticides. And this idea is very often used by activist groups to scare people. The Environmental Working Group in Washington is one of those organizations, and they will tell you that apples can have up to 36 pesticides. Now that's a scary kind of an idea. What does that really mean? It means that there are indeed 36 pesticides that have been registered for use on apples, meaning that you are allowed to use them. You will never in the world find an apple with 36 pesticides. No farmer ever does that. First of all, farmers want to minimize the use of pesticides for many reasons. One, pesticides are expensive. Two, if anyone is at risk, it's them. So of course they want to minimize the use. So you test to see what the insects are, what the climactic conditions are, and do your best using the least possible uh, am amounts. So you'll never find 36 pesticides in an apple, but what, that's what they imply, that if you bite into an apple, you're getting all of these, these, uh, these pesticides. You are getting some, without a doubt, because we can detect it, thanks to my colleagues, the analytical chemists, who are the root of all of our problems because now they can detect things down to parts per trillion. But the fact is that the presence of a chemical does not equal the presence of risk. Just because you find something doesn't mean it's doing something. It means that you have the mass spectrometers and the gas chromatographs that today can find substances at concentrations of parts per trillion. That's not finding a needle in a haystack. That's finding a needle in a world full of haystacks. So if you knew that there's one needle in one haystack somewhere in the world, would that stop you from a good old fashioned roll in the hay? Hopefully not, because you would judge that the benefits outweigh the risks, right? <laughs> but we can find things down to parts per trillion. And you know what a part per trillion is? That's one second in 32,000 years. Or if you want a better visual description, think of the width of a credit card. One part per trillion is the width of that credit card relative to the distance between the Earth and the Moon. Think about that for a moment, that we can find this. But just because it's there doesn't mean that it is doing anything. But if you listen to the Environmental Working Group, every year they will trot out their list of the dirty dozen, the fruits and vegetables that you should only consume in their organic version, because they contain pesticide residues, and you get the idea that if you eat produce from the non-organic uh, aisle in the supermarket, you are basically taking your life into your hands. Well, the fact is that there is a lot of solid research out there of scientists who say, all right, well, let's just look 
at what residues there are. Let's actually measure them. And let's see how they compare to what we know is potentially toxic, that is the allowable daily intake, which is arrived at through very complex investigation, first by feeding animals, increasing doses until you notice an effect, cutting back the dose to when you notice no effect, that's the no observed adverse effect level, dividing that by a factor of 100 for added safety, that's called the acceptable daily intake, which already has a big safety factor built in. So then you want to look at those pesticide residues and see, do they compare to the ADI in such a way that they exceed it? The answer is no. So there's no problem in giving kids our uh, apples, even though there may be some trace of pesticide residue on there because it's a trivial uh, amount. Of course, the question can come up, well, yeah, you got a trivial amount here, you got a trivial amount on your carrots, you got a trivial amount on your oranges. Doesn't it all add up and overwhelm the immune system? Well, not that we think, uh, but you can never give a, a conclusive answer on that because it's a study that's impossible to do. You can't determine cross-reactions between all of those substances in the body. I mean, if you just have three substances, you already have six potential interactions, right? It's, it's impossible to determine at all. So again, we make some good educated uh, uh, guesses. But one of the problems today is this, this collision between conventional, as it is referred to, as organic agriculture. There should be no competition between these because there's almost always more than one way to attack a problem. And what you have to do is look at what works best under your particular conditions. Integrated pest management, of course, is what we are, are driving at. And you, know, you test what kind of insects are out there, w what pesticide you should use, etc. Or is there some insect that is going to be a predatory insect in another one? I mean, these are the kind of things that one wants to look at. You just want to use the best of all possible worlds. It certainly is possible in some cases, to grow crops organically and produce them in a decent yield. But it takes a lot of work, it takes more land, and generally it costs more, but it is, it is doable. But it's a question of where. You may be able to do this in California, but you couldn't do it up here. It's different environments, different insects, etc. So what may work in one place will not work elsewhere. You have to make decisions based on, on location, based on weather, etc. But these days, increasingly, uh, focus is turning towards genetic modification because this has the potential of solving problems, although very often, of course, it is maligned. I mean, the internet, of course, is filled with uh, this kind of imagery uh, Monsanto is painted uh, as the devil incarnate. And you will have activists like Bandana Shiva going around the world talking about this and telling people that GMO stands for God move over or that we should not be using synthetic fertilizer because it's a weapon of war. And then in the most venomous and nonsensical way, People like this go on and show us graphs about the correspondence of GMOs with some condition. Autism is their current one. And they are now focusing on, on glyphosate. Well, this is a, a fascinating story. Glyphosate, uh, or Roundup as it is known, is the most widely used herbicide in the world. And there are varieties of soybeans, of, of canola, of, of cotton and corn, which have been genetically engineered to be resistant to this herbicide so that you can spray the field and not kill the crop. There have been numerous studies on the safety of, uh, of glyphosate, and I'm just giving you one recent one here. But there are many, many others by numerous regulatory agencies around the world. But to people like Vanda Shiva, this doesn't matter. They will show you graphs like this. Well, they show you prevalence of autism 
and increasing use of glyphosate. This is a criminal activity to show a graph like that. This is a meaningless graph. Of course, there is this relationship because glyphosate use has increased, autism has increased. It doesn't mean that one causes the other. You could draw the same kind of graph with organic food sales and autism because both of those have increased. <laughs> or with autism and uh, flat screen TVs or cell phones. Anything that has increased recently would have this, this kind of a reaction. But correlation is not the same as causation. That's much, much more difficult to prove. So when we look at uh, glyphosate, well, the manufacturers of glyphosate will tell you, oh, it's less toxic than aspirin, caffeine, or salt, which of course is true, but that's also an irrelevant statement uh, because we're not worried about, you know, dropping dead tomorrow because of this, we're worried about uh, chronic low dose exposure. That's, that's the question. And the reason that this even comes up as a concern is because a couple of years ago, the International Agency for Research on, on Cancer, which is an arm of the World Health Organization, ranked glyphosate, the most widely used herbicide in the world, in its group 2A category, probable carcinogen. Now that, of course, scares a lot of people, and uh, this is why you see numerous media accounts about the dangers of glyphosate. But again, the devil is in the details. What the IARC looked at was what we call a hazard analysis, which is not the same thing as determining risk. Hazard is the innate property of a material or a process to produce cancer. It doesn't tell you whether it does that under some condition. It's just that it has the potential to do this. So IARC has several classifications. Group one, substances which are known to be carcinogenic, I mean things like asbestos, tobacco, smoke, etc. And then you have the probable carcinogenic substances, which in some experiment, usually in some gigantic dose in an animal have caused cancer, therefore they have the potential to do so. What is also interesting, is that the group four, probably not carcinogenic, there's only one compound, caprolactam, which is a nylon chemical that has ever been put into that category. So everything else is, is somewhat of a risk. However, if there's one thing that you're gonna take away here from tonight, it is that risk and hazard are not the same. Hazard is the property of a material that is unalterable. Risk depends on exposure. I'll give you an analogy. If you're in a zoo and you are looking at uh, a grizzly bear, I think you recognize that there's a potential hazard there. But the risk is almost non-existent because you're looking through glass or you're looking through uh, a fence, etc. So you don't have to worry. But should you be out in the wild and encounter the grizzly bear, <laughs> it's a different situation. Then you better start running fast or at least faster than one of your friends. <laughs> because now that hazard has turned into a real risk because of the exposure. Let me point out also that presenting group 2A along with glyphosate are hot beverages. Because when you drink a hot beverage, it increases the risk of cancer of the esophagus. How do we know this? Because in parts of South America, where it is quite common to drink mate tea, and they drink it boiling hot, there's a small increase in risk of esophageal cancer, so it has the potential. Do we have to worry about this in our coffee or tea here? Of course not. We don't drink it at those kind of temperatures and we don't drink that, that much of it, but it is in group 2A. Also in group 2A is red meat. Also in group 2A are all kinds of baked goods. Why? Because they contain acrylamide and acrylamide forms naturally in the baking process. Also in group 2A, as a probable carcinogen, the hairdressing industry, because they use all kinds of substances that are potentially toxic. But in group one, which is the group that is known to cause cancer, is bacon, the stuff that everyone's mouth waters over. <laughs> so people worry about glyphosate, which is in group 2A, probable human carcinogen, not about bacon, 
which is in group one, a known carcinogen. Well, of course, the activists now paint a picture of uh, glyphosate or Roundup as the ultimate killing machine based upon this IR classification. One of the champions of that idea is, is Dr. Stephanie Seneff at MIT. And of course, you have MIT after your name that gives you credibility. Never mind the fact that she's a computer scientist and has no training in chemistry, biology, or agriculture, but she has found a niche for herself. She gets a lot of publicity by writing papers implying all of the possible links between genetic modified organisms or, or, or glyphosate and, and, uh, and disease. And uh, she writes them in these open access journals, mostly these what we call pay for play journals. You, know, you pay and you get whatever is published. The reviewing is, is almost non-existent. Uh, she writes these papers together with Anthony Samso, her colleague who labels himself independent scientist and consultant, essentially meaning unemployed. And <laughs> he, uh, he represents himself as a great scientist, uh, picturing himself, of course, with the periodic table, which right away makes it much more authentic. But just because someone pictures themselves with a periodic table doesn't mean that you have to believe what they say. <laughs> and, uh, Sam Sol uh, recently has told us about the vaccinated vaccination nightmare, not the usual stupid stuff that you know the anti-vaccine people say about uh, autism. He has found that there are traces of glyphosate in vaccines so that you're giving your kids Roundup when you're injecting them. Well, it's possible that, that at the part per trillion level you find traces because you'll find traces of anything in anything at that level. But to suggest that that trace amount given once to a kid in their lifetime would have any consequence at all is absolutely ludicrous and is devoid of any knowledge of toxicological uh, theory. If we want to be much more realistic, the question that we ask is what is our exposure to glyphosate? And how does it compare to the acceptable daily intake? Well, we can make a pretty good guess at this because we can monitor our urine. And we know, for example, that the acceptable daily intake of glyphosate is roughly 0.5 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. This has been arrived at by numerous studies based on animal feeding, on human epidemiology. Now, granted, I mean, there is some guesswork involved in here, but usually the guesswork is such that you err on the side of, of safety. Well, if we were to consume the maximum amount of glyphosate in our food every day, then it would uh, show up in the urine, because we know how this is metabolized, at four milligrams per liter. We can measure, of course, the amount that is actually present in the average urine, which is about one to three micrograms per liter. One to three micrograms per liter. That is one thirteen hundredth the dose of the acceptable daily intake, which as you remember, as I told you, already has a safety factor of 100 built into it. So it is most unlikely that the glyphosate residues on our food supply have any consequence at all. And yet, what do you see on the internet? This kind of stuff, that the food is poisoning us, and irrelevant claims like this one. These tomatoes are GMO free. All tomatoes are GMO free. There are no genetic modified tomatoes on the market. But this idea that we should fear genetic modified organisms translates into this kind of false advertising. Are there problems with GMOs? Of course there are. We know what they are. We know that crops are developing resistance to glyphosate, that they develop resistance to the, the Bt. But this is not a consequence of genetic modification. This is a consequence of biology. Any time that you introduce anything into the environment, eventually there will be resistance. I mean, this is a problem we face with antibiotics, right? Eventually the bugs will win, and we try to keep one step ahead. But even papers like the New York Times, which of course Trump calls a failed newspaper, uh, it's not, it's a very reputable newspaper, but sometimes its science can be questioned. They had an article in there about the, you know, the, all the horrors of genetic modification. But when you actually look at the real data, they didn't interpret it properly. When you look at the real data, it turns out that, that no, the risk that they talk about isn't there. Uh, and adopting this technology actually increases yield 
and probably reduces exposure to toxic substances from, from uh, fungi that would grow on, on the plants. But this is the stuff that we see. This is what dominates, and these people are very inventive, you know, in coming up with, uh, with their, uh, their visuals. And uh, this is the study that they often point at, a uh, scientifically bankrupt study that was carried out in France by Serolini. And I suspect some of you have th seen these pictures because they are all over, uh, where he claims that a group of rats that was fed corn that had been treated with, uh, with Roundup, uh, they developed tumors and the control rats did not. This was a fraudulent study, eventually had to be withdrawn because it turned out there were just as many tumors in the control group as in the experimental group. Uh, this was uh, released to the public by press conference, not by peer-reviewed literature. And the same day that he released those pictures, he released his book and a movie that he had made, portraying himself as the superhero who's going to protect us against the ravages of that unholy alliance between big pharma, uh, big agro, and farmers. Well, it turned out that the study could not be reproduced, and uh, the paper had to be withdrawn. And of course, he was screaming conspiracy, that it was big agro that uh, did him in. No, it wasn't. It was the fact that nobody else was able to reproduce this uh, work. Many, many agencies look at the risk-benefit analysis the European Food Safety Association reassessed it based on Serolini's study, you know, before they found out that it couldn't be duplicated and came to the conclusion that there was nothing there. But the marketplace, of course, reacts. And today we see, for example, great nut, nut flakes as non-GMO or GMO-free, implying that other grape nut flakes contain GMOs. No, this is just like, like you know, uh, labels that you see on, on corn oil saying contains no cholesterol, which is true because cholesterol is found only in animal products. But it's a different kind of false advertising. And while it may be true that it contains no genetically modified organisms, neither do any other of the comparable cereals. But something else about this one is that it contains no vitamin A, D, B12, or riboflavin, which is found in the other cereals. You know why? Anyone know why? Because those vitamins are actually produced commercially by genetically engineered bacteria. That's how vitamins are produced. But of course, if you're going to use genetically engineered bacteria, you cannot claim that your product is uh, GMO-free, even though that final vitamin, of course, has absolutely nothing to do with the bacterium that, um, that produced it. So uh, we keep seeing these studies that are constantly updated because the scares come out and the agencies look at it, and we see that they conclude that there just isn't anything there. That this doesn't mean that we should not keep our eye on, uh, on the technology. Because of course you never know what, what may happen in the future, something that you never thought of. You know? I mean, uh, in the 1930s, refrigerators ran on ammonia and sulfur dioxide. If you had a leak in your kitchen, you were at risk of death. And then they were replaced by freons because they're totally inert. They were much better refrigerants. Who could have ever guessed that 50 years in the future you would find the freons in the upper atmosphere destroying the ozone layer? How could you even have thought of something like that? So, of course, there's always the chance that you can find something in the, in the future. But we go by whatever evidence we have available now. And of course, by cherry picking data, you can show almost anything you want to show. You can cherry pick your data to show that, that glyphosate is toxic, or I can cherry pick my data and come up with a study equally valid in the peer reviewed literature that shows that glyphosate has an anti cancer effect. So it, it's always a question of the preponderance of information because you can find individual studies to show anything you want to show. Finally, the question that, that very often comes up, and I'm sure that it come up in this area, is your right to know and whether or not there should be labeling. This is a very thorny issue because the question is, where do you draw the line? I'll give you an example. You look at this label and uh, you see that the second ingredient is soybean oil. Well, let's say that soybean oil came from genetically modified soybeans, but that oil 
contains no remnant, no vestige of that genetic modification. This is pure oil, which cannot in any way be distinguished from any other oil. So if you cannot chemically distinguish it, why would you label it? Because as soon as you label it, what does that imply? It implies that there's a reason for that label. It is, that is somehow different, but it isn't different. Of course, people can argue, and they do, that, okay, well, I'm not worried about any health effects. Okay, I, I understand that there's no health effects here, but I don't want to support this unholy industry. So I want to know what foods you know, are, are, are GM. That's, not, that's a, a more reasonable argument than the worry about, about health. But these people do have an out. You can just buy organic because by definition, you cannot have any product of genetic modification there. But you know, the bottom line to all of this is that life is full of risks. You cannot get away from it. You can be out for a casual walk and terrible things can happen. <laughs> yeah, really terrible things. Oh, don't go, oh, we're nice people, we faked it, they're fine. <laughs> but they are not the innocent little creatures that you think they are. <laughs> what we have to look at is the risk-benefit ratio. That's what matters. And the thing is that taking no risk at all, that may represent the biggest risk, because then you never get anywhere. We can't afford to turn our back on the GM technology, because it can deliver the goods. Interestingly enough, even in Rome, the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, let me tell you, not your most liberal organization, <laughs> has said that scientists have the responsibility of feeding the world. And if it takes genetic modification, that is what should be done, because the population is going to increase. There's no doubt. And pretty soon, there'll be 10 billion people coming to dinner. We have to feed them somehow. It has to be done with the judicious use of agrochemicals, I think including some aspect of genetic modification. This is what modern farming is all about. This is why we need to thank some of you guys who are farmers, because you do an incredible job. You know, it used to be not that long ago that 70% of the population was involved in producing food. Today, it is 2%. 2% of the North American population grows the food for the rest of us. That's a tremendous alliance between farming and chemistry because the agrochemicals, when properly used, give us a very effective and varied food supply. But it's a message that's difficult to get across to the public because fear-mongering gets a lot more, uh, more press. Science does not have and does not claim to have all of the answers. Science is a process. It's kind of a race towards the finish line where the finish line always is moving away from you, but you're getting closer and closer to it.